Uh, you know, I listened to you for such a long time. I think some of the first records I bought was with uh, Charlie Hunter. And okay. I actually, actually saw you with Charlie like way, like, what, 18 years ago, I would say. I think it was in Vienna you played. Uh, I think well, it was. Well, let's see. It couldn't have, let's see. It could it have been 18 years ago? I played with Charlie. Yeah, it could have been. I think it was like 2005 him. in Porgy and Bess. Yeah. That sounds right. That was actually right uh, at the end of my time with him. I think I stopped playing with him in 2005. Ah, okay. So that sounds right. And the first first period of time that I was playing with him, we basically never went to Europe. Yeah. Because he was kind of burnt out on doing that. So we played almost exclusively in the U.S. So, yeah, that makes sense. It would have been at the end. Yeah. Yeah. So, you you know, then I started checking out your records and... uh First of all, I, I want to ask you, like, what's happening on the department, you being a band leader? You know, the last one I heard was All Things Bright, which oh, I, uh -huh. I, I want to touch a little, that one. But, like, you know, what's happening there? I mean, are, are you making some records? Well, it's... A new record in the it's, it, Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting time. I was... Uh, before the pandemic, I was on this thing where I was trying to make records kind of as a regular part of my life, you know. And make them a little bit more informally, and uh, yeah. and not put a lot of consideration into what happens after I record them. Um, and I thought that that actually would just help me. I was searching for a different process. I felt like the process I has had been doing up to that point involved. Uh, well, it was very costly. You make the record, then you, yeah. you you print it physically. You try to figure out how to promote it, and all of these different things. And it just tended to be costly and it, and time consuming. And I started to feel like um, if I actually only focused on the recording and nothing else, I mean, not even mixing and mastering, then I could make more recordings and I could document more periods. You know, I, I often felt like things I would be interested in or even music I would be writing would sort of not get documented and mm -hmm. sort of move on. So uh, anyway, it was an experiment. The pandemic kind of put the brakes on a lot of that. And I'm just now trying to pick up some of the threads. But uh, I have a quite a few things that are recorded and not released, mm. uh, which puts me in a little bit of a funny position. Um, uh because some time has passed. So some of it feels a little bit like, okay, is this really what I want to give my energy to now? Yeah. Um, I have new music, you know, I, I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's a weird moment. Uh, but I guess I, yeah, I mean, the answer is I do have, I have been recording. I do have, oh, I super do have quite a few things recorded. Um, and at least some of them I, I need to, to really be prioritizing. I've, I've started slowly trying to figure out how to, how to put some things out. I mean, I did make a record, uh, after the one that you're talking about that was a uh, collaborative so it it it's interesting I, I thought of it as being at least partially my record but in many ways it was organized mm -hmm. and motivated by a couple of friends of mine Glenn Pacha uh, and Adam Levy oh okay um I find it. yeah and that record came out on um you know Adam Levy you're a guitarist right? yeah yeah sure sure I know him. yeah 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 Adam so that, that record came out on Sunnyside oh okay um yeah Say It Quiet, I think is the name of that record. Okay, I have to find it. Cool. Um, so I guess that's the most recent thing that's at least sort of under my leadership. It's collaborative. Yeah, yeah it's he heavy. Like, like what, what what you mentioned, like this idea of records. Uh, I mean, I'm facing the same thing. You know, I have like four masters at home that I recorded. Like some of it was like two years do, ago huh? already. Yeah, and I'm like, shit, well, what to do? Yeah. You know, like. Again, you, you put it on your own label, kind of on Bandcamp now, and then again, you invest so much time into mailing journalists and magazines, and then you get some of these reviews, and then what? You know, I'm, I'm also questioning this whole process of yeah. what the idea of a record is. I mean, that's for me right now. I think this is... I a It's a very volatile time for that, right? It's a very... Uh, it's a transitional time. Uh, yeah. 
it's a good thing to explore. I mean, it's a good thing to think about. Well, I love recording. Me too. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, I came to the conclu conclusion that it's it's a big part of what I love to do. Uh, I like to do it for its own sake. I like to do it because I think it helps me improve. You know, it yeah. requires me to make certain kind of commitments to things. And I just really enjoy. It's not like it's easy all the time, but I enjoy it as a process. Like, and I think it's, it's very helpful. So, um, it's been hard to navigate the tension between how much I like doing it and how impractical it, it has become, you know, like how uh, a, a recording as a thing for sale mm -hmm. is a, is kind of problematic. I mean, it, it's, it's just been, but you know, it's, it's still important for a whole host of reasons, but it, but uh, to sell the actual thing is challenging. Also like to what extent is it, you know, are we moving away from physicality? Is everything really about streaming? Yeah. Are we moving away from thinking about, I mean, I know there's a kind of new interest in LPs. I'm not yeah, sure it's... how much, how, I mean, I don't know. I hear people who are excited about it. I, I guess it's a thing, but I don't, uh, I'm not convinced that it's enough to fill the gap of sort of what was lost. So, uh, you, you know, is there a destruction of the idea of a, of a, you know of a larger thing are we making singles now is it uh, you know with the streaming world uh and the attention span and all of that there's you know you could make a strong case for putting out singles right and mm -hmm. some people are doing that some people even in jazz world are doing that yeah um yeah I, I don't know it's it's is the is the recording important on its own is is making a video of the process of making the recording even more important than making the recording because that's actually what people watch you know it, it's it's all it's all kind of up in the air I, I don't have good answers to any of these questions really you know but um yeah, yeah. but okay. all i know is that i like to record and i'm trying to figure out how to do it more often yeah but you also did your own label right i mean some of these records are you released on your own like yeah, yeah, yeah. I've kind of tried all the different versions, you know, from the, uh, you know, the version where the record label pays for it and they own it and the one where yeah. uh, I pay for it and license it and the one where uh, I put it out entirely myself. Yeah, I've tried a lot of different versions uh, to try to see what makes the most sense. You know, it's it's a, they all have their strengths and, and weaknesses, you know, their, their pluses and minuses. Um, yeah. Nothing. I think, you know, when you're first starting, it makes a lot of sense to put a record out on a label because it, it gives you the affiliation, it gives you a, you're associated with other artists, you're associated with some other entity, you're not just like totally on your own. Um, but then at some point, I think, depending on how things go, there, there's a strong case for uh, trying to do more on your own, at least to learn about that. Yeah, um, definitely. So yeah yeah especially nowadays with like you know what we talked about this uh idea of what you know what's the future actually uh, right it, for me the curse it's a it's a funny idea we had this tour in october and you know i sold cds on gigs in europe and right but people who bought cds were like above 50 55 you know and then yeah. like what what do you you know how to deal with younger people also and right like I don't know, uh, should I give you like a code for download for eight euros or something? You know, after it's, a gig, yeah. it's bizarre, right? It's, it's yeah, it's hard. It's hard to know. Yeah, it's hard to know if you know, or maybe you should sell a T-shirt, right? And then they, oh they, yeah, you know, also like a lot, a lot of younger people I know are, are primarily listening to music on YouTube, which is also like it's kind of fascinating to me knowing, you know, that YouTube was not invented to be a music space, but but it actually it turns out that that there's things you can find on youtube that you can't find exactly anywhere else so so it's uh even if you're just listening to an album not not like a live concert but a, like a with, with video even if it's just audio on youtube there's there are things there that you can't find elsewhere and it makes sense in a way that but that, that's what people are doing but mm -hmm. um you know as a platform that leads to some kind of like significant monetization for the kind of music that I typically see myself making and like making it, it's not, it's not great. No, you no. know, it's a, you know, there, there are ways to make money in the streaming reality, but, uh, 
you know, it's a, it's, it's a little bit like lottery tickets or something, you know, like you, there's always like the exception of that person that made money. But but for the most part, most people are who are making, you know, music that's closer to the music that I want to make. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's very challenging to make any money in that in that world. So, you know, that's that's also kind of. It's, it's sort of the conundrum of the time, you know, like what yeah. what should we do? <laughs> How should we approach this? Yeah, uh, bizarre. You know, I do think that the if you decide to engage in the social media um, space or in, even in streaming in a way, the digital spaces, uh, I, I've been mostly not so engaged in those spaces, but if you decide that you want to, it's clear that they're, that they're very hungry, that they, that it's not a place to, it's a monster you have to feed. Yeah. It, it's not a place to just like drop something and then disappear and then drop something else. I mean, essentially you have to engage with it in a very regular way. Yeah. Um, so I think that's part of my hesitation. It's easier for me to kind of do something and then leave and then come back and do it again. But it, but the kind of relentlessness of it is is challenging. I mean, I think that's also why making singles would be a smart way to navigate the, the current mm-hmm. space. But uh, but it's problematic if you actually don't feel like doing that. You know. But, but yeah. I think that that's that would be you know if you were just trying to accommodate the. The reality we live in and give it what it wants i mean we should probably all be making singles and we should all be making video um, yeah <laughs> yeah that's yeah we'll we'll see it's, it's bizarre it's, i'm observing you know and talking with you guys and other musicians and you know how to deal with this stuff and our, our generation kind of follows it but if you talk to the older generation you know like people who are in their 70s it's for them it's yeah. so hard to comprehend some stuff that it's just sure it's just like what what's happening <laughs> it's like, yeah yeah it's yeah bizarre man you know but yeah we'll yeah see. We'll see. yeah trans transformation it's always a yeah you know a little bit challenging uh, yeah or a lot challenging but yeah uh, that's this is a transformation transformational that's time in terms era. of like how yeah. how do we transmit the music that we make to other people and uh you know how do they receive it and all of that but yeah but the you know, talking about bright, brighter things, bright things. I wanted to ask you about the, <laughs> the tr- just brightness in there. Yeah, there is, there is. But uh, you, you know, you you said you you're writing new music also, and but I wanted to ask you about how you write music, and you know, I've read the liner notes for each tune that you wrote on on Bandcamp. You know, and mm. uh, I found it interesting that you kind of wanted to challenge yourself also to change how to write and uh mm. like you know that you said you will just write chord changes on one tune i think and then mm-hmm. one is like an all the things you are version which kind of went different track and i mean what's your process usually when writing and how to keep it fresh um it's a good question i mean i, I think the the part of what keeps it fresh is to is to not have one process like uh to to I feel like I'm constantly trying to interrogate, uh, uh, you know, what did I do previously and mm. how might I do it differently? Um, and I, because I think essentially um, there's, if if you're, so I, I have a, a lot of interest in a wide range of sounds, you know, a wide range of, you know, consonances and dissonances mm. and orchestrations and colors and, and um, styles. And, you know, I, I feel like, uh, I'm more interested in trying to find a way to navigate the broadest amount of of material as I can. And so I feel like in order to do that, um, you know, I have to think a lot about, well, what is it I'm trying to do? So I, sometimes mm. I frame it as like that you have to invent a problem. And then the, the inventing the problem is actually uh, more important than when you try to solve it. You know, I think most people, not, not most people, but you, let's say like young writers, a lot of times you, you know, you go to the piano, you sit at the piano, you play a chord, you you think of a melody or you know nowadays maybe you play it into your computer and you let the computer spit it back at you and then you you know try to sing something or mm-hmm. uh whatever that process is um a lot of times it'll be limited by the your capacity to navigate the technology how good are you at using the computer how how many chords do you know you know if you're not a piano player or a guitarist mm-hmm. or so so there's just so many ways you know you can write um you know, I constantly think about how do I do different things. Like, uh, um, you know, you you can write uh, 
in, in this case, the things you're talking about, I, what can I do fast? You know, what are the kind of things I could do like on the train on the way to the session? Mm. Oh, okay, well, I can write a tune with it's just chord changes, doesn't have a melody. I improvise a melody. That kind of thing works the best when you have less instruments playing. Yeah. You know, you can have a lot more flexibility the smaller the group. Uh, I think the bigger the group, the more architecture you need to hang things on uh, and maybe the more specificity or at least specificity in con in terms of concept. Um, but yeah, there's so many, there's so many things. Uh, uh, you know, I spent the, the most recent thing I was doing, I would, I was taking, you know, something as simple as like, a, I mean, you could take things from other music and then just yeah. try to deal with it. That That's, that's endlessly fun, you know? So a tune like blue and green, which is basically a, a five bar song with, uh, you know, fairly simple chords that, that are all kind of in a similar space. So, you know, what is that? And, but then it happens at different speeds, you know, it's yeah. just short and then they exp extend it. And when you listen to it, it sort of sounds like magic. Like, what is this song and what are they doing now? And now it sounds like something different. And what is even the melody to this song? It's just such a vibe. Um, so I took that as a as a departure point and just thinking about five, you know, a different kind of five bar song that could also be expanded and contracted. Um, so I don't know. That's just one. That's just one of many ideas. Yeah. That's but cool. but I guess if I could make a big picture, you know, after all that rambling, if I could make a big picture assessment, it's just spend time thinking about um, the problem, uh, maybe more time thinking about the problem, and then the the writing, the actual writing part is is fairly easy. Yeah, that's technical. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah like I'm now I'm just trying to solve this problem I made. Uh, do Do you keep like a sketchbook also of ideas? Yeah, I have a, I have a sketchbook. Yeah, oh, okay. I have a sketchbook. Some of that stuff gets lost. Uh, you know, it's it can be quite chaotic. Um, but yeah, I have a sketchbook. I spent some time over the last several years writing music for podcasts, which I found mm, was really was really fun because it was like a. I would mostly have sketches, you know. I would number them. Uh, that's another thing I do in my own, own writing too. Is just like sit, uh, try to write the first thing that comes to mind until it gets stuck i mean generally the process is you you feel like okay this is the thing i'm writing something and then you get to a place of i don't know judgment or whatever it is that makes it stop but it happens where suddenly you're like a little bit stuck so at that point i just move to the next line i write like the next number i start some, something totally yeah. new i just leave and start again i try to see how as soon as i feel a stuck energy i just pivot to okay That's what else cool. and uh and i feel like you can generate lots of little like nuggets like that and then go back to them and sort of see what they are um one time i met a poet who said he used to write words every day he would he would just like write words or whatever came to mind just like small little nuggets of abstraction put them in a box and the box would be labeled by date month year he would do that for the first part of the day the second part of the day he would go 20 years back into the box that he had put 20 years ago wow. and pull pull out the words and the words would be all words he put in there but they would be completely unrecognizable because he didn't know why he put them in there to begin with and then he would use that to actually make whatever he was trying to do whatever he was trying to That's write cool. so he would basically have this generative space where he was generating ideas and then as a totally independent thing he would be taking the things he generated and trying to make something out of them and there would be so much time passing that he, it would be like encountering something from someone else. But Fresh, it was yeah, actually new, his yeah. stuff. So I thought that was fascinating. Sometimes my old, you know, messy sketchbooks that I find from things I wrote are, they feel like that to me. Like, I'm just like, what is this? Like, what was I thinking about? <laughs> you know? That's so cool. And, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's good to have. It's good to have, uh, you know, piles of things you can dig in. Dig in. Yeah. How come you decided for the trio? For I mean, the last two kind of records, I think, are you know bass, drums, and right. tenor, saxophone, or bass clarinet, and you know I listen I, I listen to it. It's you know I love the trio of this lineup, like Sonny Rollins and you know all these guys. Of course. Like, how come the trio? Well, I guess you know in some ways how come not the trio yeah. before before now I, you know i mean partly as you said like i was always a little intimidated i played a lot of trio music um and quartet music but with another horn so mm. so like still with no course uh 
all throughout my time and even my formative time in New Orleans in the 90s, we did that all the time. Mm -hmm. So I always loved that openness and I always loved the, the, uh, just the feel and the sound of it. But, but in order, like, in a sense of like, I'm going to put out my trio record, I think I was carrying a, just a little bit too much of a, you know, burden of history. You know, mm -hmm. what about those Rollins, Rollins records I love so much and, you know, Joe Henderson, State of the Tenor and, yeah. uh, Bradford and, um, you know, it just felt like it was a very well traveled road um, that was a little bit intimidating. So, you know, I think I got older and I, I, you know, I started caring less about that. And I, you know, I also felt that it it was a in terms of what we we're talking about before. How do I record more often? How do we record in a different way? Uh, it's easier, you know. Yeah. It's it's, awesome. it's 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 cheaper and it's also like more. Uh, uh, there's a lot more flexibility, you know, in, in terms of like if I'm going to come up with sketches, uh, it's just a it's it's a more flexible format. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I like it. I have another trio record actually that's that's not mixed. <laughs> oh, beautiful. but it has some good things on it. That's with Matt Pym and Jochen Rookert. Oh, really? Um, oh, wow. Yeah, I, I did nice. another tri trio session. Um, oh man release it come on man we need i mean it's funny like i feel like i can do a trio record every month you know oh, sure. I, like sure. uh even with sort of minimal preparation you know just sort of think about what i want to do the day before almost and just do it so you know maybe i'll get back into that i was recording quite a lot uh leading up to the pandemic i was trying to do like a record a month i wasn't quite doing that but i was oh. that was kind of what i was trying to do once again like not mixing, not mastering, not doing anything, just paying the cost of the studio. So, uh, and and short sessions, you know, some of those sessions that you that you're talking about, like like four hours. Sure. You know. Yeah. Sure. So. That's fun, also. Yeah, financially and everything, it's easier. It's fun financially, and it's just to realize that, like, do I feel like these records that were, you know, um, that I spent so much more money and so much more time and all are are they necessarily better than yeah. these records no not really um it's back to like having having different problems to solve you know it doesn't mean i don't want to still do these big ambitious things but you know i guess i felt like in terms of my output it was leaning more towards that uh and and you know i hadn't really documented um uh, playing in, in the trio setting and also playing in like a you know, some of my favorite jazz records, old records, they're kind of informal. Like they feel mm -hmm. informal. You yeah. can hear that they have little mistakes. You can hear that they're, you know, you listen to Miles, um, you know, the things they left on some of those, like, you know, Miles recordings and you hear him, they, oh, you know, play black chords or play this or, you know, they're, they're just like changing their mind or experimenting. Uh, so many of the recordings I've done over the last 10 years for people have involved like, intense preparation and then just like kind of no uh there's no question what you're going to do when you go it's in there there's no room for, in a way yeah. yeah there's no you're just trying to execute a vision which is fine but there's no like oh now we're in the studio how do we feel today you know what if we tried this or what if we tried that you know nobody has you know going to the studio is expensive and people put, yeah. are putting a lot of pressure on themselves it's just people don't use the studio as a place for exploration you know it's a it's just a place to execute this thing you know essentially or of course this is a big generalization i would just say many of the projects i've been no, no, but that, i know what you mean feel yeah. more or less like that like yeah, yeah. what should we record what do you guys you know oh let's try to record you know that you might record something there that you didn't even plan to record like that never happens like, you know yeah yeah so it's true it's true yeah and, and when you set aside some space for that it could be great it could it could also not be great <laughs> like i mean you can you can you know ha having sort of a little bit more cavalier attitude about being in the studio means that some things might not work so i think partly people are afraid to you know to for that to happen yeah. um and so you know i get i get it <laughs> i get that too but you know also like you can find something really cool that you wouldn't find otherwise so i don't know no i, I, I know what you mean like with this uh, highly polished records you know that are everything is perfect and everything is like 
I think many times this has been lost, this kind of warmth, or how should I put it, the mojo of the records from the that exists in the older ones, you know? Like of course, yeah, yeah. You know, it, so it, yeah. You know, both have their both have their place, right? Like sure, it's, sure. it's not I'm sure. not in a position to argue that that the other one is not also great, but it just just felt like when I was in the studio, it tended to feel you take one chord, you know, for like like this this kind of stuff where there was like virtually no feeling of openness or discovery together, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, just trying to see if I could reclaim some of that in the studio was something I was thinking about, and it's it's ongoing. I think I think I could I could do a lot better in terms of that too. How like the tension between how much do you prepare and how much do you not prepare, you know, like is, is something to spend time playing around with, you know, like, uh, uh, cause you can definitely prepare too little <laughs> and it can also not be good for that reason. So, yeah, I don't know, but it's also for you to keep it fresh. I mean, yourself as a musician, as a band leader, that it's interesting that it's right. like, like you said, you know, playing over some changes, some licks, or, I mean, your, vocabulary it's, right. it's also like oh man where are we going now or right and yeah. ironically a lot of a lot of the thinking around this came from doing these podcasts like i was telling you about because that podcast mm. were like uh you know minimal written musical material and sort of maximum amount of uh sonic uh choices and and you know what if we played things in this register or yeah. what if we played it really slow or what if we played this combination of instruments and what if you played the melody or what if or what if we just you played it only a solo i mean just all these kinds of things that are evocative for for podcast music where you're mostly creating uh like secondary mood mm -hmm. type of you, you know music that's that can't be you know in most cases it, it needs to contribute to some some emotional quality but it, but people have to be able to talk over it also right so yeah uh or maybe it's a little small amount of material in between things they're saying or something like that so it, it was really cool to realize that i could have sort of limited amount of of written things and you could just expand it infinitely orchestration wise or, or mm -hmm. otherwise you know and that was really fun to imagine like what if i did what if i thought this way about my own stuff not just about podcast music and um i still want to do that more but that, that's something i really do want to do uh, that's quite cool yeah. but the, you, you mentioned Sonny before and uh, you know Joe Henderson and Branford like uh, you remember what, what was were these guys of course some of the main triggers what, why you started to play jazz or what, what were the first records actually that you heard that kind of blew your mind I mean you remember that yeah I remember a lot of those um um so there was some particular Sunny records like Saxophone Colossus, mm, uh, yeah. uh, Nuke's Time, uh, The Sound of Sunny, mm. Roy Haynes. Uh, those are really big. There was a Charlie Parker record called Now's the Time that was that was on uh, on Verve. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of these Charlie Parker things have now. I feel like they're hard to find as independent albums. Uh, you know, a lot of them were initially made as forty fives anyway. Uh, so so much of Charlie Parker's music now seems to exist on these collections. Yeah, you know, like yeah. The dial, the dial, you know, stuff or the stuff on Verve. So you sort of lose. At least for me, it's easy to lose track of like which albums are there. You know, it just starts to kind of all run together. But there was that one record called Now's the Time that was huge for me. Uh, John Coltrane's Giant Steps, mm. uh, really, really big. You know, in the beginning. Um, and you know, I was in North Carolina. I was kind of country. My my brother, uh, my older brother, went to performing arts high school, and his roommate was a jazz drummer. Mm. And um, he actually was like making tapes for me. You know, there was like tapes of like uh, Terrence Blanchard, and Donald Harrison had a band together. Yeah, in the eighties. So yeah. Tapes of that stuff. A lot. A lot of us were pointing. You know, from North Carolina, we were kind of pointed towards New Orleans. So. Uh, several people from that performing arts school went down to study with Ellis Marsalis in New Orleans. Um, the, the folks that were older than me. And then I, I went down there. Also. You also did. Yeah. Yeah. I did. Yeah. And people after me. So there was like a kind of a little bit of a, 
conduit, you know, those of us in North Carolina going down there to study with Ellis. And um, so, the, so, you know, Winton's stuff, you know, the early stuff yeah, at sure. that time was really hugely influential on all of us. Uh, Bradford stuff, you know, uh, I mean, all those early, like Scenes from the City and Renaissance, yeah, all those early yeah. Bradford records were huge for me. You know, Winton, of course, like Black Codes and and uh, Mars South Standard Time and J Mood and uh, you know all those records are big. Her Harry Connor Jr.'s first records were were influential on us. Oh really? You know, oh well. Yeah, I met him. Uh, I love that record called Twenty, but he had another one that was just I forget what it was called. It had like a black and white kind of cover. Um, you know, ha Harry is interesting because he he really wanted to. Um, be like a modern jazz piano player. He moved to New York and he he was going to like, you know, his influences were sort of like McCoy and Herbie and all that. And then he realized that everybody else was doing that up here. And what they weren't doing was playing like James Booker. Um, and so he kind of like rediscovered his, uh, or he realized that for him to stand out, then he would bring his like New Orleans stuff. And that, that's actually like, was a big part of his trajectory. And I see that happening to people all over <laughs> from wherever they come when they yeah. come to New York. You know, they come like, oh, I want to do this. And then they say, wait a minute, what do I have, you know, from where I'm from? If I dip into that a little more, like that might help me carve a little space for myself. Um, How was that but, like for you? Like when you came to New York, I mean, like I, I know you went to the new school, but like right. you know, entering the scene, like uh, was that heavy for you? I mean, like in the beginning or? Yeah, very heavy. I mean, I in the beginning, I always thought I was sort of like a long term visitor. You know, I, I uh, <laughs> it helped me deal with the things that were hard about it because you know I grew up, you know, in a very very rural way, and then I went to New Orleans, which is quite small, you know, by comparison. Huh. So uh, you know, I kind of thought, oh, I'll be, you know, I'll come to New York and uh, try to get better. My reasons for coming to New York is like, and. Uh, And then I felt like, okay, well, um, I'll I'll stay here until it's too, you know, until I can't do it anymore, and then I'll then I'll go back. And it, back to New Orleans was my original thought. But you know, the more time passes and passed, <laughs> the more uh, the more I started to feel like, oh, I don't really want to be anywhere else. I I, I love it here. You know, I want to be here. So it was an interesting. Mm. It was a slow process. I'm not sure. If I had come, if I had not gone to New Orleans first, uh, it would have been, I think, too too difficult of a transition. You know, the, yeah. the New Orleans gave me enough of a uh, confidence, and I played. I had got to play more, and it was a little bit. And I also felt like New Orleans had embraced me enough that if I that I could go back there and I I could work. So that gave me a certain feeling of like, okay, well, if it gets too crazy, I'll go back to New Orleans. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, in many, in many ways that life unfolded just slightly differently that I probably would have, you know, it's just like it's so interesting, right? You, there's so many variables. You find some cheap housing, you find some, uh, you know, these different little fortunate things. I, you know, I went to school, which bought me a little time. And then when I got yeah. out of school, I started playing with Charlie Hunter. And that helped keep me, you know, keep me here. How did that, that, that gig happen for you? I mean, how did you hook up with Charlie, actually? totally by accident i mean like the crazy like why you moved to new york kind of story i i uh i knew who he was i had seen him play at snug harbor in new orleans mm. like his one of his first bands like when he had dave ellis in the band yeah um so that would have been when i was living in new orleans so in the you know in the sort of mid 90s and uh and in new orleans i had played with this drummer quite a bit named stanton moore oh yeah and um and so And Stanton and Charlie were friends, so, so I, I I actually literally ran into him in the street outside of outside a grocery store in Brooklyn, and I I saw him and I was with my roommate at the time, this uh this bass player named Wayne Bachelor and and uh and Wayne said that's Charlie Hunter we should go talk to him and I was like I don't want to bother him I'm like no no let's not talk to him no no we got to go talk to him it's Charlie Hunter I said no nah, let's leave him alone he, you know he, I don't know him. And uh, and Wayne, you know, it's very gregarious. And he he went over there, and I was with him, and he introduced himself, and um, and so then I ended up talking to Charlie also, and and then Charlie said, "Oh, John Ellis." He said, "Oh, I, I, Stanton Moore told me about you. I know who you are." Uh -huh. And uh, and so 
you know, it was just timing. You know, I think at that point he was thinking that he might want to add a saxophone to his thing. And, you know, Charlie, he can be very sort of intuitive like that. So, mm-hmm. you know, he just set up a little session. He said, like, yeah, man, we should play sometime. And, the, and he, we did a little session some, somewhere. And then, and then it was very interesting process. I liked it a lot, actually, because he never actually asked me to join his band. It was just like his manager called me. He said, hey, man, can you do this one gig? I said, okay, cool. Yeah, I could do the gig. Everything was like just kind of the next thing. And uh, and then like, oh, you want to make this record? And then after a while, I was like, oh, I guess I'm I'm doing this. But it it it, it happened in such a great way that I think mm-hmm. allowed him to decide. You know, he could have just decided at any moment to not do things. You know, I was never like formally asked to be in the band or anything. But I think I was there for five and a half years. Well, <laughs> that's that's a long one. Yeah. So it was it was. It was actually really, it was, it's cool. I've, I've thought back on that a lot. You know, sometimes people say, oh, you want to audition for this thing, you know? And he said, oh, okay, I'm auditioning now. Oh, this is, you know, basically he put me in a audition, but without letting me know, right? Yeah. I think, I think that was smart because it meant that I was just, it was easy to just be more natural, you know, like. Um, yeah. My friend, uh, Aaron Goldberg said that, when he started playing with Josh Redman, that Josh did a very similar thing to him, mm. you know, just like, yeah, never, never like auditioned him, but just kind of, oh man, we should play. Oh man, you know, oh. yeah, you know, funny, right? Yeah, it's way, way, way better than, you know, when you hear the Stan Getz auditions and stuff like that, what was happening. Like, that, yeah, right. That's way nicer. Yeah, I mean, definitely. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I have friends that are piano players and they're doing an audition and the you know person said, Don't worry, just be yourself, you know, just play, <laughs> you know, just play your normal stuff, you know. Don't don't even think about the fact that this is audition. It's like, well, once you're doing that, you're you've already messed it up. Like, exactly. Yeah. You know, just don't don't tell them it's audition. It's even yeah. better. You know? Yeah. You know, I wanted to ask you when 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 in, you were in New York, you, were you immediately starting to lead your own groups also? Like I had, I had, and... Yeah, I had been leading my own groups before i came to new york i mean i actually had made my very first record when i was still in new orleans yeah it's and fantastic man i i i heard it just i knew about it but it was you know for a long time nowhere away available and then <laughs> and it's really cool i mean oh, it, man. it's a really nice record thank you man thank you thank you for listening um but yeah so that that one i had made so i yeah i had interest in doing my own process you know it, some of it is just being very practical like i had a sense that uh, you know, I wasn't a bass player, right? I, you know, I, I was like, like gonna probably have to make stuff happen for myself. You know, the, the yeah, even for my own group, sometimes I'm like, well, who should I get rid of to make the band smaller? Well, that would be me. <laughs> so how do I get rid of myself? Yeah, you know, I don't know. It's funny, right? It's just like the saxophone well, always yeah. seems a little bit like, uh, you know, the, not the most needed in some ways to to make a functioning, you know, good sounding group. <laughs> So, so, uh, so I sort of had this sense that like, I would, I would probably need to be proactive about making my own music and making my own things happen. So, so, uh, I mean, honestly, just mostly as a means of survival (laughs) and, and, and wanting to do this and wanting to not have to stop doing it. So, so yeah, that was kind of the motivation. And I was, uh, I made a record early. I mean, I had a, that, that was a fun kind of band in New Orleans. We played quite a lot together. We had a little you know feeling of a band feeling. Mm, it's nice yeah. um and then uh yeah and then i was up here and um i was only up here for like a pretty short period of time and then i uh broke my arm and i had a series of setbacks but then i ended up going to the new school <laughs> and uh you know it just so happened that that period when i went to the new school was uh it's like when robert glasper was starting there and mike moreno and uh Marcus and E.J. Strickland and, uh, you know, just so many, so many people. Um, mm-hmm. I can't even begin. But Casey Benjamin was there and uh, just like uh, Kenyatta Beasley. There was just a great, great group of uh, musicians yeah. that were there. Yeah, it was a huge, huge, uh, a huge number of people there at that time went on to do great things. So uh, that became kind of like my school family and we played a lot of stuff together. And I think yeah i ended up doing everybody was kind of doing their own trying to do their own gigs we were all playing each other's bands and um 
So yeah. Uh, yeah, because know. you played with Glasper on that record, right? For Fresh Sound also. Exactly. I played Wood, with, right? with I think mm -hmm. yeah. I played yeah. on his first his first record for Fresh yeah, Sound. Exactly. Yeah. Um I played on some of Mike Moreno's first records. He played on some of my records early on. Uh Glasper did you know, I used to go to New Orleans and do these gigs and then go to Houston also. And uh as a part of the same little run and we have some we did some gigs together. Where Glasper was in my band quite quite, mm. quite a half, quite quite a handful of times, you know that. Unfortunately, we never recorded oh, back funny. back then. But um. But yeah, that was a, yeah, that was a that was a really great time. It's sort of like jarring to think about how long ago that was now. But <laughs> yes, yeah, twenty years already. That's like... a long time ago. Yeah, but but it was it was a. Uh, yeah, it was cool. It was long enough ago. You know, twenty years is long enough that like kind of everything is different like all the venues are different and the towns are different and the sort of opportunities are a little yep. different you know everything is different so like what it meant to get your own gig and all that was a it's a little different now you know i think so um, what was what was getting how did you connect with jordy and fresh sound actually i mean because that was like the label i think for yeah, New York musicians. I think everyone, everyone was on that label. From there was Brad a lot Nardo of people to... on that label. Yeah. yeah, there was a lot of people on that label. You know, that's an excellent question. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm actually not sure that I know the answer to that. Like, if I hmm. tried to contact him myself to do something, or if he he contacted me because of other things I had done, yeah. you know, that were already on his label, or um. I'm actually, I actually really, that's a really excellent question. I, I remember I how, how I met him. You do? Uh, yeah, I made him, met him like on a gig in New York on a Steve Coleman gig. And wow. Malaby was there, I think. And he just like, hey, Jordy, you should meet someone. I was like, yeah, okay. And then I had the record out like yeah, four months yeah. later. I was like, man. Right, right. He was really, he was really, uh, at that time, right? He was like really trying to grow. Yeah. this whole idea of the new talent side because yeah. you know the other side was like where he would sort of you know take take over these masters that that uh had gone out of print and like re-released them but uh yeah it was it was a, it was an interesting time it was a he was documenting a, a lot of people um yeah. yeah i'm not sure i'm not sure exactly because the, then you also did the crisscross record right which yeah, quite a bit later. Heard that, yeah. Yeah, maybe like ten years later, at yeah. least. I did. I did a crisscross record. Yeah, yeah. That was a. Uh... That's a nice record. Te Tekins had Tekins yeah. had co contacted me. You know, I was in a mug competition in '96. Um, so really, you know, I was really quite young, and Tekins contacted me around that time. Mm. And uh, it's funny because I had just made my own record, right? That very first record that the. the is you know the first one I did myself, and um and I told Tekins, oh I made my own record, and I think that that actually kind of deflated his you know he he was really interested in having people's very first records, and and the fact I had already made one on my own label, kind of like put me off of his list you know for a little <laughs> while, um you know he has all those introducing records of everybody's you know sure. first introducing Chris Potter introducing and he introducing Kenny Garrett I think yeah I think um, so yeah. So, um, so yeah, I didn't really end up doing hearing from him. I probably played on somebody else's crisscross record, but, but basically it was, yeah, not until quite a bit later that, that suddenly, you know, he asked me to, to do another record. It's interesting. His, his son is now. Yeah. It's still running. Yeah. It's now running. Yeah. I just made a record with Manuel Valera that's going to oh, really? come out on crisscross. Oh, wow, beautiful. So yeah, who knows? Maybe I'll make another one for them now yeah. that the new, the new version. Yeah, um, it's cool that it still exists. It's a, it's a. I think it's an important label, especially for too. the New York scene. You know, like uh, when you check the, the roster, I mean, it's like everyone. You, exactly, you, he documented you know, a lot of things. He like, documented incredible. a lot of good things. Yeah, I guess Fresh Sound is still going too. Although I've kind of yeah. lost track. Yeah, it's still going, Jordy. Yeah. But it's kind of. It's still searching for younger people, which is nice. I sometimes go there, and I was like, "Man, who is this guy?" You know, and he sounds yeah. incredible, or she. Yeah. And it's like, man, I have to check it out. You know. It's yeah, yeah. It's, 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 isn't that fun? Like, it's yeah. amazing how how many good good musicians there are. You know, I think that to me, yeah. I constantly think about that. You know. Yeah. And how did you connect with Lonnie Smith? 
And, you know, you've been, I wanted to ask you that, you know, I love the stuff you did, like that evolution and what is mm. in the beginning and that, you know. Right. Right. Well, uh, let's see. You know, it's it's just like many things. I think you you know somebody who knows somebody, right? Mm. And then they, they bring you in. And, and Lock, Dr. Lani, um, you know, if anybody who ever went to see a Dr. Lani gig knows that, like, he transfixes you as an audience audience member like you, you cannot yeah. take your eyes off of him and the music kind of revolves around him in terms of like what he's doing and he's in every way like watching him listening to him it was just like profound but you know in terms of the business side of things he was generally liked to have someone else do a lot of that stuff and you mm. know including kind of like putting his bands together and that kind of thing which is not really? so unusual oh. for people people of that generation and not so unusual and so i think I think I got I got pulled into two different projects of his by people who were kind of musical directing in a way like uh, well, the first time there was a big band gig at the Jazz Standard that was probably, you know, Jazz Standard was a major home for him in, in New York. Uh, and I think they would often do like birthday celebrations and, yeah. and they would try to try to do big things. So it was probably like a Dr. Lonnie birthday of some kind. And then uh a friend of mine named Corey King, a uh, trombone player, was was uh, writing these big band arrangements, and um, I was also friends with the, the drummer that was playing with 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 him at the time was Jamire Williams, and I was playing mm. with him quite a bit. And so I think they just asked me like um, to be in that big band. So I think I met him like that, and then um, that was just to do some gigs. And then there was another version of his band where he had a horn section, like four horns. But mm. um, Ian Henderson Smith somehow was kind of organizing and and putting the music together. It was a lot of like revisiting some of Dr. Lani's big hits and you know doing them with horns. And so uh, Ian asked me to be a part of that. And then you know the more that we played together, I I I felt like that that uh, Dr. Lani and I had a nice we just had a nice. Uh, connection yeah. human human connection too like mm. it just i i really enjoyed him and, and we he was a jokester and i i liked i liked making you know having having fun with him and you know he liked to do you know he said all these funny things anyway i just i, I really loved him and but i thought musically i felt like we had a nice thing mm. and uh i don't know it, it, i i like to imagine it's very hard to know but i like to imagine that that because of the, those connections that that's why I ended up doing more things after because I tended to when the different people would lead at the, you know, I, I tended to be involved in the things that had the bigger, you know, mostly he was working as a trio, even to the end, yeah, but, sure. you know, here, yeah. here and there, he would have like more horns. And I, I tended to, to be able to do those things. And it, I, I can't even tell you how lucky I feel that that was, that I had that opportunity. Oh, sure, man. Yeah, I can believe that. And it was, it was, you know, one of the great, one of the great experiences of my life to be able to, to hear him play like that and, and be a part of it. And, you know, it's just total, total magic, total unique, you know, one of a kind kind of never mm -hmm. to never to happen again, kind of musician. So it was, I learned so much from just being around him. Um, so did you ever go to Europe with him? Like with this larger group or not? No. Uh, that's a good question. We played in, we played, we did go out of the country. We played in, we did Montreal jazz fest. Mm, okay um i'm not sure that i don't think we played in europe i don't i don't remember playing in europe with him if so it would have been just like a one-off maybe or yeah, something i, I think maybe they yeah. ask you know sometimes they say are you already out here you know can you or something like that but I, i'm pretty sure i i'm pretty sure not mostly in the states yeah yeah yeah, yeah. is it uh, i checked your discography and like uh, i wanted to ask you about what one thing how did Stink end, end on your right? Good question. <laughs> that, that, that album. I mean, I, I actually have that CD. I mean, you know, I, I love Stink, and yeah. To be honest, I, I wasn't even aware you're on that album. I, that well, even if you listen to it, even if you listen to it <laughs> carefully, you have a hard time finding me there. But because, uh, so I, one of my very good friends and, and mentors, very important mentor for me, is the guy that produced that record. This guy named Robert Saden. Mm, okay. and he was a teacher of mine at the new school when i was at the new school and has i've stayed in touch with him ever since and and uh he's been just tremendously helpful and uh yeah i can't say enough about him and, and how much he knows about music but he mm. he produced that record and uh 
you know, it's really just out of his kindness. I mean, like basically when the record was done and they were just putting little finishing touches on it and, you know, Sting was doing some more like vocal overdubs and, you know, these are, these are records that with, with budgets that I, you know, I can't even really, I can't even imagine, you know, because they have these extra days to just extra weeks, even just to like do these little things. So basically during that time, uh, Robert said, and, just said he just was but like oh let me try to bring some of my my people in on this and um and so i was i was yeah he just asked me to do it i mean i remember going there and uh sitting around and basically sting was just singing these overdubs and things and he was very nice sting was very nice mm. to me, but you know he, he didn't he didn't know me of course sure. yeah. uh but then you know it's when he was done he would leave and we would have like i don't know half an hour to like <laughs> I like what if you play some bass clarinet on this and what if you try this and what if you try that and um so yeah i um i was very fortunate i just sort of snuck a few little things on there it's, it, even now i can't i think there's just a little bass clarinet here and there i always felt like the goal was uh have it on there enough so that that sting would notice it but not mm -hmm. like if he noticed it too much then he'd be like oh what is that no i don't want that it was like yeah. a, i felt like we were being snuck on there a little, a little bit uh, the secret kind of, herb, like what is this? Just a secret little touch of something to to give it a little something nice, you know. It, it, yeah. it was something like that, but um, yeah, yeah. It was it was a it was a it was a. I learned a lot from that too, you know, just just watching how that works. And it's a completely uh, different beast, yeah. Such sessions, yeah. Bring your horns, bring whatever you got. Let's see what we can. Okay, oh, what? Okay, a little bit of this on this, a little bit of this on that. You know, it's. it's interesting you, you still yeah. play, play the bass clarinet a lot I mean, oh yeah i love oh, yeah, when, yeah. when you, what you do you, you should do way more man I, I oh love... i appreciate it i appreciate it really? you know who i've been playing with your uh slovenian slovenian brother igor oh lumpert yeah you did the new records right with him i think yeah and ju i just yeah. play bass clarinet with him uh yeah, yeah. that's one I of the I have, here and there i have these projects where i like pretty much only play bass clarinet rudy royston has a band that i pretty much only play bass clarinet oh, awesome. in. Okay. we just made a another record um it's such a beast you know bass clarinet man it's, it's such like, a crazy instrument yeah it's such a crazy instrument but I but that. uh I, I yeah i really enjoy it you're right i think i probably should do i should do it more i you know uh it's interesting you know you spend all your time mostly of your time working on you know for me i spend all my time working on saxophone mostly uh but then if you bring the bass clarinet everybody likes it more <laughs> i mean in the bass clarinet sometimes i feel so like i don't even know what the notes are that are coming out you know like i'm just it's like oh that's that note wow like i i feel so like not in charge of what's happening but people like it more anyway because it's just like it's just a it's a cool sound you know yeah. and, and i think it's people haven't heard it nearly as much so it just tends to be like wow what is that like wow it's cool yeah um I like that. Yeah, I, I, I played with Paul McCandless, you know, oh, yeah. in Oregon quite a lot. And, yeah, yeah. And you, you know, he brought on tours the bass clarinet, and he was like a child when he picked it up because it was, yeah. you know, for him it was like some new discoveries or something. Yeah. He was a monster. I was like, man. I remember like, seeing him play that live somewhere, maybe in New Orleans, and he had this kind of like pickup that he put into the, you know, one of the hardest things with bass clarinet when you're doing it with larger bands with like a lot of sound. Mm -hmm is uh just to 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 mic it in such a way that it's not picking up everything else to come like through, he, yeah. he had some kind of contact mic that he put into the neck and it made it sound so good i don't, I, I, I i remember i even asked him about it and I forget, he told me but it was like something that his friend made or something you know mm. it was not something you could easily get at least at the time but uh yeah but yeah that's man. another reason why it's hard like in you know bass clarinets is great in trio for example it it's not just because it's not loud. I mean, at this point, I can play it pretty loud, but it's, it's, uh, I mean, it's not as loud as saxophone, but it's also from a frequency standpoint. It's, it has all of these frequencies that are easily, um, so there's so much bass and bass mm -hmm. drum, and it, it, they're easily kind of wiped out by the other instruments in that frequency, um, spectrum or something like that. You know, it's something about yeah. the actual frequencies themselves that make it hard to hear it. You know the sound comes out of the whole thing too so like when you're playing it on stage and the band is loud even if the audience can hear it sometimes you can't really you can't really heavy, hear it yeah. especially when you play lower you know so you find yourself like 
playing only high on the bass clarinet, which is like kind of silly considering, you know, it sounds so good low, right? You miss yeah. out on all that. Yeah. So I don't know. Oh, but yeah, man, that would be nice to hear you. Yeah, just just bass bass clarinet trio. Context, I need to but... do some more stuff. Yeah, I need to do yeah. some more stuff. Yeah, that's cool, John. To just you know, not to take more of your time, like uh, to leave you a Sunday afternoon. Like, what are what is on the schedule for this year? I mean, like touring wise or playing wise. I mean, what are the plans? Good question. Uh, I um. It's been it's been a lot of travel since the beginning of the year. I I, I went to oh, really? Hong Kong for oh, wow. for a week. Yeah, I went to Hong Kong for a week to play with a a friend, a guitarist named Tara Ver Chang. Um, and then I went um, to St. Bart's to oh, play wow. at this festival down there with a with my own group, and uh, I have a whole batch of new music for for that group that I I hope to record this year. There's some, been some talk about doing that. Um, that's the double wide still, or no? Like a no, I do have another double wide record though. That's oh, not beautiful. out in the, in oh, the same fantastic. batch. But no, but this was just a. It was music I wrote for. It's like the most standard kind of work, jazz uh, instrumentation. It's it's a trumpet, trumpet, tenor, piano, bass, drum. No, oh. um, but it's, but I've never actually really written music specifically for that. Um, I have a few things on some of my older records where Nicholas is playing, but. Sure. But um, but yeah. So I have that music that's uh, I think turned out turned out well enough that it'd be nice to document. Um, and then um, and then I just went to Korea to play with a oh, wow. really great Korean piano player named Youngju Song. Um, and uh, and and I'm about to go to Norway to play with a guitarist there named Bjorn Sali. Oh yeah, you know, sure. You know Bjorn? Yeah, no, yeah uh i've been going i went twice last year to play with him he's he's a good he's a very good friend and he's been hooking up different things and we we had made a record before the pandemic but uh it basically got pushed back farther and farther you know because of the pandemic but it uh but it came out finally last year and then we toured some for, to to promote it and then now we're going to make a new record um next week oh uh, okay basically. so I'm busy <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's been a lot of that. It's been a lot of traveling. I'm uh, making a lot of recordings with a lot of good friends. You know, I'm making a recording with a, a a great Brazilian drummer named Alex Kautz. I'm doing that at the end of this month. Um, yeah, there's 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 a lot of recording. It's a it's a good it's a productive time. It's a, it's That's a, good. Yeah, it feels like a good time. I mean, I. I still don't really know exactly how i landed in this spot but i like i said before i, I always thought that i would never work as a sideman so i had to do my own stuff but somehow i think as a byproduct of uh doing more of my own things i Nothing i've now that. now got to this place where I, I get asked to do to do lots of things with lots of people and, and yeah. it's great it's the it's sometimes it's i feel like it's challenging i can't quite keep it all together but i but i you know that's my only complaint. <laughs> it's just that, I mean, I'm, I'm so happy that I that I'm sure. doing it. You know, so cool, cool man. Yeah, John, thank thanks you. for sharing some of this stuff, oh, man. I really appreciate thank it. So, thank you so much. Thanks for thanks for thinking of me uh, to be included on your on your podcast, on your interview, on your yeah, and uh, cast. Yeah, whatever you want whatever we call this. Yeah, uh, I'll let you know when this is out. I'll send you a link and everything. So okay, please, and, please. Uh, but if. You